Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for our webinar, Caring for Textiles. I am Daniel Fraser, Library Conservator at the Preservation and Conservation Laboratory, Heritage Library Division, NALIS. We ask you to keep your cameras off and your mics muted. You are invited to type your questions into the chat for the question and answer segment at the end of this webinar. Let me introduce our organization, the National Library and Information System Authority of Trinidad and Tobago, NALIS, is a country's coordinator of all library and information services. Beyond the Heritage Library, there are over 25 public libraries, three libraries in correctional institutions, libraries in secondary and primary schools, and special libraries, and several government agencies, all administered by NALIS. Please visit our website www.nalis.gov.tt for more information about our services. We'll post a link in the chat of this webinar. One of Nalis's key responsibilities is to promote and preserve national heritage information. The Heritage Library Division, located on the second floor of the National Library Building, Port of Spain, Trinidad, helps Nalis fulfill the goal of acquiring, promoting, and preserving national heritage information. Special collections acquired or donated to the Heritage Library Division consist of mainly traditional library items created by or of interest to a significant person or organization of Trinidad and Tobago. I invite you to follow the Heritage Library Division on Facebook at Nalis HLD TT. The Preservation and Conservation Laboratory is responsible for ensuring the overall longevity of library materials. With attention to the Heritage Library Division and its collections of historical importance. The PAC Lab, which was officially commissioned in 2013, helps NALIS fulfill its role as the International Federation of Library Associations and Institutions Preservation and Conservation, or IFLA PAC, Regional Center for the English-Speaking Caribbean. Just recently, NALIS and IFLA signed a new agreement for a further three-year term from November 1st, 2021. NALIS is a part of a network of 16 IFLA PAC centers around the globe with the aim of providing knowledge and expert advice on preservation and conservation practices within their region and to serve as IFLA's key area of work on safeguarding and promoting culture and heritage. We've continued our mission of raising awareness of preservation and conservation issues through our preservation webinar series. In case you've missed any of our previous webinars, the link to the NALIS YouTube playlist is posted in the chat. This webinar is yet another opportunity to foster the partnership between British Library and NALIS Trinidad and Tobago. Nicole Rachel Moore, who joined the British Library as the new creator of his Caribbean collections just last year, has been actively working to build partnerships in the Caribbean and collecting contemporary publications, including from Trinidad and Tobago. In fact, earlier this month, Ms. Moore invited Jasmine Simmons, Director of Heritage Library Division, to participate in the UK Society for Caribbean Studies conference panel entitled Independence Now culture, politics, and 60-year commemorations in Jamaica and Trinidad and Tobago. Our director was a part of a panel of cultural heritage professionals from both nations discussing how galleries, museums, archives, and libraries are marking this significant moment in history. And in March, the British Library hosted a sold-out event called In the Place, In the Spirit, La, Maribu, La Maribosa Realidad of Trinidad, which featured readings and um, conversation with Trinidadian authors Ayana Lloyd Banwo and Anthony Joseph. Also in March, the High Commissioner of Trinidad and Tobago, His Excellency Vishnu Danpal, visited the British Library to discuss potential collaborations. And following his visit, he agreed to join the Eccle Center Advisor Board. And back in 2016, one of our very own librarians was the recipient of the Friends of the British Library Preventative Conservation Voluntary Work Opportunity. 
For a three-month period, Camille George Librarian One Special Collections and Rare Books worked alongside the British Library Preventive Conservation Team and their colleagues in conservation, conservation science, curatorial departments, reading rooms, and imaging services. In fact, it's during this time that Camille met today's facilitator, Liz Rose. Liz has been the textile conservator at the British Library since 2015. She completed her Master's of Art in Textile Conservation at the University of Southampton in 2009 and initially worked as a freelance textile conservator, then with the Imperial War Museum London, and then finally at British Library. I know Liz is excited to share about her journey into textile conservation and about her work at the British Library. So over to you, Liz. Thank you, Danielle. Thank you very much. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Good morning, everybody. Uh, if you're listening from the UK, good afternoon. But I'm just going to find my presentation. So I'm going to talk to you about textiles in the British Library this, uh, this morning, and, uh, and I'm going to show you some textiles which I have found on my journey uh, whilst I've been textile conservator at, at the British Library. But I'm just going to introduce you to the library and tell you a bit about a bit about it. So if you were here in London, uh, this is the British Library. It, you find the British Library at 96 Euston Road, NW1. Um, it's not the only part of the British Library. We have part of the library in Yorkshire, in Boston Spa, which is right in the centre of the UK. We have another part of the library at Stockton's on Tees, and, uh, and they administer the public lending rights. And we also are sh shortly to have another part of the British Library, which will be found uh, in the centre of Leeds. So uh, in 1973, there was an Act of Parliament and this split the British Library from the British Museum. This, sorry, I'll start again. In 1972, there was an Act of Parliament and the British Museum Library was split from the British Museum to form the British Li Library. The doors opened uh, at this building um, in, on the 24th of November, 1997. And the British Library is for everybody. It is for research, it is for inspiration, and it is for enjoyment. It's a very good place to come for a cup of coffee if you're traveling by train to the north of the country. So if you were to come into the library uh, through, the, through the doors I showed you previously, you would come into the central atrium and this area here is used uh, heavily for events, and, um, but the area is dominated by the King's Tower, which you can see as soon as you come in through the front doors. And the King's Tower holds the founding collection of the British Museum Library. It was a collection that was collected by uh, King George III. It was bequeathed to the nation by his son, George IV. And it contains approximately 85,000 books and pamphlets. It's uh, temperature and humidity, humidity controlled. Uh, there are little data loggers lo lo located on each floor, which record the temperature and the humidity. And also the glass is uh, UV, UV safe to prevent the sun um, causing any damage to the spines of the books that you can see. And these books are, you are able to um, take these books out in one of our reading rooms. And occasionally you can see the shelves moving backwards and forwards and somebody retrieving a book. But it's a heavily used area. People are always working around the base of the King's Tower, as you can see. People race to get their seat or the seat that they like. People always sit in the same place. Um, and if you aren't working outside, you can work in one of our reading rooms. Uh, this is, uh, we have 11 reading rooms here at, uh, 
at the British Library in London. We have one reading room at the British Library in Boston Spa. And you can you use these rooms for quiet study and, um, and, ac and, and accessing the collection items. The dedicate, this is a dedicated space. So if you want to get a reading room ticket, you have to be over 18. You have to have proof of your address and proof of your signature. And if you are an overseas visitor, you can also have a reading room, a, a, read, a reader's card. And you, but the only proviso is that you have to renew that, renew that every year. But the British Library, as I said, are, is for everybody for research, inspiration, and enjoyment. And these, uh, we have over 2 million collection items. Um, we are a legal deposit library, which means we, we get our items on a daily basis. We get approximately 80 items on a, on a daily basis. And if that item is published digitally, we get the digital uh, copy of that item too. So we have um, a digital collection, which is over a petabyte. It uh, doesn't really mean much to me, but it's a, lot, an, a very, an awful lot of digital uh, data. We, our shelves um, are approximately 750 kilometers in length, and the items grow at a rate of 80 items a day. So our collection also includes um, the Magna Carta, Leonardo da Vinci's notebooks, uh, today's newspapers, uh, we ha also have the newspaper archive and websites. So we take a, a snapshot of UK websites um, each year. This is part of our legal deposit obligation and they can be consulted on the UK web archive. And if you were here today and we were visiting conservation, you would be walking over the terrace and you would enter conservation through these doors here. Conservation wasn't, uh, or as we call it, the British Library Centre for Conservation. It wasn't part of the original building. It was built onto the library at a later date and finally opened in 2007. So in order to do that, we run our conservation in um, different, different streams of work. So we have a mobile conservation trolley which goes out to collection areas. And, and they do small repairs. Um, as a textile conservator, I'm not part of that because my repairs aren't usually, aren't usually small, um, but they have small, do small repairs for less than an hour. Then we have running repairs, which uh, are, is anything up to 10 hours. And then we have a system of conservation bids, which is, our, is estimated work. And this is, part, this, what, this is what makes up our annual work program of approximately 10,000 hours per annum. And which is split between all, all conservators within the team. We do conservation for exhibitions, both our, our internal exhibitions and also for, for loans going out. Conservation for digitization, both internal digitization projects and projects that uh, we do on a commercial basis. We have our preventive conservation team, which uh, Camille George was part of in 2016. And both these uh, on all these areas were supported by conservation scientists and imaging scientists. So this is uh, um, Vicky working in uh, at her desk. She's actually working on a book that was used in uh, an exhibition, the Harry Potter exhibition. And in conservation, we uh, carry out our, our conservation work and we're defined by a set of ethical principles. And we, we take the view of, of minimal intervention and, and uh, treatments which are fit for, for, fit for purpose. So we don't want to overcomplicate our conservation treatment. And, and that a, is a view of the studio. We have a wonderful space to work in uh, with uh, north facing skylights so we get no direct sunlight onto our benches. We are temperature and humidity controlled, which was that we were very grateful for over the last couple of days because it meant it was uh, pleasant to work uh, in the conservation studio. 
So I'll just tell you how I'm going to split the rest of my time. I'll tell you a little bit about uh, becoming a, a tech bar conservator, which Danielle has, has, has um, said a bit about it. Um, I will talk about the library's collections and some of the items that I've found within those library collection areas, the equipment and materials that I use, briefly about the deterioration of textiles and how you can, and, and how you can help prevent that. Um, a bit about handling and storage, which might help you um, if you're if you're um, storing or um, large items like wedding dresses, mannequins that I've used in exhibitions to, for uh, to display loan items on, and then the last bit at uh, our question and answer session. So uh, Danielle has sort of told you mostly how I became a textile conservator. I found out about uh, conservation uh, when I first started working many years ago, and uh, I was lucky enough to work at a company called Atlantis Paper. Atlantis Paper has, has developed uh, most of the um, museum boards and conservation papers and boards that we use in the libraries today. I didn't know that back in 1984, I would be so familiar with, it, with items that I use uh, in a, on a daily basis uh, in uh, 2022. Um, and, uh, and really, I could not become a textile conservator when I wanted to become a textile conservator because it was too expensive to go back to university and I couldn't raise the funding. I didn't know how to raise the funding. So I had that opportunity once my son had gone back to school and uh, we had computers and you could write uh, the same letters to lots of different people and ask them whether they would support me to go back to university. And that's how I managed to raise some of the money to go and study textile conservation. But I will go on to uh, talk about some of the library collections and how they're, they're split. This is a very uh, brief outline of how the collections are split, or the collections that I have looked at. Asian and Africa collections, contemporary British collections, which are, um, are much more, as the name suggests, contemporary collections, European and American collections, and Western heritage. And I'll show you some of the textiles within each of those areas. The Asian and Africa area. So this is a piece of extremely old silk. It's dated between the fourth and the fifth century. It is, uh, we know that because the text down the middle is, is called Karoshti script, and that was only ever written in between the fourth and the fifth century. It's extremely rare. We think it is the only one in the world. It's uh, 1400 millimeters long and about 400 millimeters wide. And this forms part of the Stein collection, which is part of a digitization project called the International Dun Wang Project. The British Library um, head up this project, so, and uh, it is a groundbreaking international collaboration to make information and images of manuscripts, paintings, and textiles and artifacts from Dun Wang. And, our, and the archaeological sites of the Eastern, Eastern Silk Road available online um, through online freely available online through educational and research programs um, I've put some links and I think Danielle has put all the links into in, into uh, a booklet for you so this is a, a, a beautiful piece of, piece of still, silk um, it's dated about 1787. It's very large. It's a meter wide and it's two meters long. It's um, it's a royal order from the from Emperor Shah Alam II, and he's making um, late uh, Miss, uh, Mrs. Plowden, Sophia Sophia Plowden, um, an, into a noblewoman, and she is apparently remarkable as she is especially gifted with devotion and rare fidelity. And somewhere in this script on this on this gold area the, and these painted areas here, um, it, it says that this item is currently in the gold exhibition, um, uh, which is open till the 2nd of October, if anybody's here. And it's, 
I used magnets to um, adhere it to the board because you can see this gold area in the center isn't sitting flat. So I've, I've painted little gold ma magnets and use them to uh, keep the gold against the board and prevent it moving during display. And just to show you something completely different, this is a little uh, sleeping, a uh, little, uh, little Japanese book. It's a little baby in, a, in, a, in an acrylic sleeping bag uh, that's zipped up the front. And our, just to illustrate that our collection has something for everybody in it. I'm going to move on to a contemporary British collection. These are uh, two books which the library acquired in 2017. They are contemporary books, as you can see. They are covered in textile. They are decorated with beads and embroidery. And this one, again, is covered in a textile. This is material that has been pulled to make it fray around the edge, quite deliberate decoration. But those books have been housed in in a way which I can show you later to protect the covering um, and to keep them safe so they won't, don't deteriorate on the shelf. This is uh, a, a, again from the from that same area, contemporary British area from the archival manuscript collection. And this is a package that was sent um, to by Ruth Prowers Javwala. She's a, an author and, a, and she writes or she wrote screens at uh, screens, scripts for screens, for scripts for films. And uh, there are four of these packages, if my memory of this uh, serves me right. And I was asked to open them because uh, they they were wrapped in cotton and they were stitched together. Um, so we had her daughter visit the library. And with the curator and um, the lady that was doing the research into, into Ruth Prower Jabwala, we opened the packages this is recorded on video. And inside we found these manuscripts. Um, this package had been sent from Bombay in 1976. And uh, we opened the package in 2017, 2018, I can't quite remember and they managed to find the man who wrapped these packages up in 1976. He was, he was still alive and well in Bombay. Uh, we also have t-shirts in our collection. So this, this is a t-shirt from 1990. It belong, it, it's part of a, um, an archive that was given to the library for a thespian workshop called the International uh, Festival, uh, International Workshop Festival. And I have two of these, a black one and a white one. They came into the library in a, in a plastic bag and uh, they couldn't go into the collection area in a plastic bag, so they had to be wet cleaned. They could, um, and then packed away within a box with interleaved with acid-free tissue. But we also get, if there's a book and the book has a cuddly toy that comes with it, then the cuddly toy is also part of that collection. Um, this little book here is attached to the elephant. I would say, I would say paw, but elephants don't have paws, but this is, looks as though he's got paws. And uh, so he's kept with his, with his, with his book. European and American departments. This is a, uh, I, I know Nicole is here um, uh, listening. She showed me this book. It's a, a book by Jackie Hinkson, which uh, I think those in Trinidad and Tobago will know. And uh, it's covered in pink, pink silk. So when she showed me this book, I thought I would take it away and put it in a box that will protect it. Otherwise it just sits on the shelf. And when somebody pulls it off the shelf, they will uh, abrade the textile. So I, when I show you packaging and storing, I, I will show you how I package that book. Uh, this is a collection of uh, poems and images that were printed onto silk. 
and in that box came a little file of, uh, of um, uh, liquid fibroin and also a little silk cocoon in a little bottle. And we had to seal the bottles up uh, so that if this went into the reading room, nobody would, nobody would be able to open them. And also from the same collection, um, these are, uh, we have, there are, in this collection is 16 silk, silk screen printed um, po posters. They're, they're a meter high and about 600 millimeters long. They're quite large. As I say, 16 in the collection, they're printed silk screened onto calico. Um, and those came, in, came into my area to um, rehouse so that they could be accessed more easily and, um, and they could go out to the, go, be available in the reading room. A look at the Western Heritage area. So this is a, a book. A lot, of, many of the items in Western Heritage are quite old, and this uh, uh, this book is dated 16, 1637. It's a holy Bible. Many of the it, it's embroidered, as you can see, it's embroidered in metal thread, which is this these areas down here, and and this is silk. Um, we think she's probably a princess because she's wearing. A crown, but I'm not sure um, that we know who she is. And it was published in London, uh, as I say, in 1637, and it's in amazing condition for something from that time. This is also uh, very old. This is a parchment. Um, can't think what it is. Anyway, it's, uh, it, it's a grant. It's a parchment grant and it's dated uh, 12, 1269. These are silk cords, which is why it came to me. And this is a, a, a seal, which is pure gold and the silk goes through the seal. So something like this proves quite awkward to, to pack. So I, we have um, a dedicated uh, box maker or two box makers up in uh, Boston Spa in Yorkshire, and they are also able to cut out um, very nice uh, pieces of foam. So they take the image with the measurements on and they feed it into Photoshop, um, do some conversion and then feed that into the box making machine and then the, ni the knife on the box making machine can trace and cut out the exact image uh, in foam and it does it very beautifully. And then that piece of parchment will just sit within that area um, and the seal and the cords will be safe in the cutout here. And just to show you this, every item that we get has a has a request slip and this shows where the collection is uh, located, what date it comes out and what and where it is. And this one is uh, has come into the BLCC, which is the British Library Centre for Conservation, and it's very exhibition and loan. So that means it's either going going in a display here or it will be going on a loan out of the building, but this is actually in our, currently in our gold exhibition. This is a, a leather wallet. This, the reason it came to me is it's lined with silk and the silk has split down the center. So I was able to treat it and support it with some specially dyed nylon net and stitch that into position. Um, this belongs to belong to um, the fiance of Rupert Brooke, the First World War poet, and uh, Phyllis Gardner kept her love letters from uh, him in that wallet. It, it was bulging with letters, and uh, uh, we also have the love letters um, from that wallet. So, uh, briefly about. Uh, equipment and materials. So I use uh, most of the most of the things that I use in my practice are, are standard items. I use dressmaking scissors, small scissors, pinking shears. 
uh, but if I, I have got a pair of little tiny uh, surgical scissors, and uh, so we use some items from uh, from medicine, um, needles, sandals, standard needles, beading needles, which are really thin, and curved curved needles. Uh, some of the curved needles are beading needles, and some of the curved needles are sutra uh, needles. Pins, uh, glass-headed dressmaking pins, entomological pins, spatulas, tweezers, measuring tapes, uh, dressmaking inch tapes, little glass weights, glass beakers for dyeing. It is a, a mix, a mixture. So that's my tool roll. So those are my standard pinking shears, standard scissors. These scissors here are my uh, medical scissors. And these are tweezers. I'm sorry, you can't see the end of them. One, one are curved, one is straight and one is curved, and they're medical tweezers. So it really is a range of absolutely standard equipment and some specialist equipment. And there are the needles. So these are all standard needles that I can go and buy in the shop. But these, and these are the curved beading needles, which are extremely useful. But these little needles are um, medical needles, uh, surgical needles. And these are little packets of um, entomological pins, which are the pins that uh, people use if they're pinning insects onto boards. Um, but they're very, very good for pinning silk because they're so fine, they don't make holes in the silk. And this is just a little box of uh, glass headed pins. So the materials we use are uh, standard threads, polyester threads, but we do use some uh, sort of interlocking threads. They're not, they're not conservation threads at all, they're, but the Guterman Scala is a very fine monofilament thread. And I think it's an interlocking thread. I'm, I'm not sure. Um, there is in the, in the information that Daniela, that I sent to Daniela, some information about some of the um, materials that I use. Um, double text is, is a, a fine mesh that we pull threads out. It's really, really fine. It's that when you stitch with it, it's like stitching with the hair. We use different dyes for dyeing uh, nylon and cotton, lanocet and solifino. Um, and fabrics, we use standard fabrics sometimes. But the, the nylon net that we use is a conservation grade, it is called conservation grade nylon net. And I know, I think there is only one supplier in the, certainly in the UK of that net, but I'm sure he'd be happy to send um, materials to Trinidad and Tobago. Uh, polyester wadding is what you, I'm sure you'd be able to, you, you probably have the same wadding as I do. Needle felt is probably a bit more specialist. That is from a conservation supplier. Cotton tapes and Velcro, of various tissue, uh, various uh, thicknesses, tissue paper and Bondina, which is a spun polyester tissue paper. Really, um, uh, I like I like it. I'll use it a lot. It just makes things flip very nicely. So the deterioration of textiles. So textiles. All textiles are damaged by light. You probably know that uh, when, when you're wearing something. This textile here was my, one of my first jobs when I came to the library. This is a very degraded silk flag. It's both been damaged by uh, light, uh, by use, and also by hanging in a, a room that they had an open fire. Um, and all this blackness is sucked from the fire. But still, and as I say, silk is particularly vulnerable. So light will cause the fading of dyes, the weakening of, fat, uh, of the fibres, so that if it was silk, it would just snap. And the effects of light are cumulative. So a short period of bright light is the same as a long period of dim light. So to minimise that light damage, <laughs> if, you, if you want... You, you really have to store your textiles in the dark, which is really not what we want to do, because we want to show our te textiles. 
but never display textiles opposite a, a window or in direct sunlight because that will immediately cause uh, light fading. And if you can use blinds or, or curtains to minimise the light in rooms when not, when not in use. And if you can, again, if you can display things for short periods, and if you have more than one, then then swap them, then rotate them, swap them over, if that's possible. Insect damage. So at the moment in the UK, we are struggling with moths. Uh, it's moth season because it's so hot. You have you, uh, at night. You have the lights. You might have the lights on, and you have the windows open. Um, I'm sure you have the same sort of problems and the moths come in and although we say moths like wool in particular, they will eat anything if they're hungry and this is a part of a manuscript cover that we've been, I've been working on with my student Lois and she was first is cleaning it and this is what she found and um, we were a bit worried that these moths had just come into the collection uh, but uh, they hadn't. This particular manuscript has been in the library's collection for about uh, 10 years, um, and we were only just finding these moth cakes, three of them, but this one in particular has a body inside it, so you could, you could feel it. Um, so they like dark, undisturbed areas and corners of cupboards. If you, uh, uh, certainly, certainly at home, you have to check underneath the flaps on your pockets or underneath the collar because uh, that's where they like to go. They like stains on clothing because it's extra food for them and they like it stuffy areas. So I'm afraid it's uh, good housekeeping is the answer to um, preventing uh, moth and insect damage. So if you've got something that's really valuable, really vulnerable, then put it, seal it in, in policy. I currently have all my winter jumpers in polythene bags with a, a zip lock on them, um, hoping them off. But please, if you put something into a bag, check that it hasn't got any moth cases um, visible. Uh, otherwise, they will eat when they hatch. They will eat when they when they when they're hatching. It's the grubs that do the damage. It's not it's not the moth uh, per se. Do so you need to check your textiles periodically, especially in the spring uh, when most of the eggs are hatching? Um, and we say over here, we're not allowed to use mothballs anymore. I think Danielle thought that you might be able to use mothballs uh, because they are the, the naphthalene in the mothballs is considered, considered carcinogenic. And we would also advise not to use cedar oil uh, on. on uh, Sometimes you can buy little wooden balls and, and impregnate that or rub cedar oil into it. And this is volatile and we believe it has a limited effectiveness. Temperature and humidity play uh, um, a big part in looking after textiles and fluctuations cause the textile to expand and contract. And if it's too dry, fibres become very brittle and they may snap. And if it's too damp, you might get mould and rusting of the metal components, uh, say in silk and cotton. So if you, you might have seen a, um, a cotton pillowcase or a, a, a cotton sheet, and they have little patches, little rust patches on them. And that is the rusting of the metal components. And the same, and you get it on, you, you get this deterioration on silk as well. So we're always aiming for a stable, stable environment. I know it's really difficult unless you uh, um, work in an air conditioned environment, so like we're lucky enough to have at the library. Um, and te textiles at home, if you can, a cool, dark, dry location and a ch in a chest of drawers or a wardrobe or a box. And just to show you this image here, this is the uh, manuscript that we've been working on, the manuscript cover on it uh, that we've been working on. And this cover has got uh, wet or damp and the dyes from the, from the front of the cover have leached into the lining, but they've also discolored the cotton. You can see that's yellow and it's down here and the red is down here. And also it's begun to discolor the, the paper 
So you get discoloration, permanent staining, and um, from this sort of side bleeding. So packaging and storing will help protect your items. So uh, this is my colleague Lee, who's helped me uh, pack some items. These uh, the library doesn't have many uh, pieces of clothing, uh, and uh, but we are packaging up a, a, a set of uh, clothes to go, which we're going to be shipped out. And these uh, we would have a box as big enough to collect to contain the biggest item that's going in it, but we don't have to fold it that many times. And we would separate, we would just start off by lining the boxes with tissue, and then we would separate um, each element with layers of tissue paper. And we would also use tissue rolls. So if, if there was something like a, a large dress, say a wedding dress, you could roll, make tissue rolls and you could use that to support the folds in, in the dress or in the large, uh, large item of clothing. Um, and that's what we've done here. So this had a lot of excess um, material and we've used many tissue rolls to su support that. And hopefully that item arrives um, at its destination without being too badly creased. And we would have finished off the top layer with another layer of tissue and then we would have folded these flat from the lining of the box over the over the item to finish finish the box off. Again, that's packaging after display and surface cleaning. These items were on display uh, for an exhibition. Uh, the exhibition lasted a lot longer than it should have done because of COVID and the galleries were shut down. So we had to ensure that everything was clean and packed up before it was sent back to the back to the lender. This is a little storage box which I was lucky enough to have made uh, in at our box making facility. So uh, uh, they cut out this matrix of squares for me. These are uh, little tiny peg dolls that have been that have been dressed in. Um, I think this is the Pirates of Penzance. Uh, opera costumes. These are made by uh, a lady and then they were donated to the library uh, um, by her husband. And I needed something to keep them secure in the bottom of the box. So the little squares of plastazote that I cut out, I was able to reformat and use them to, to tuck down and to secure the base of the, of the, that the little peg dolls were sitting on. This is, uh, I think, uh, one of the books I showed you before. And this, this again, was packaging for a loan. These were going off to the Netherlands, three different embroidered books. And um, I created a silk plinth, a, a board with a well in it uh, so that the book could sit on the silk plinth. When I showed it to the curator, he said that he didn't know whether they would show the front or the back cover. So I then had to make a plinth for the for the back, and that's the silk plinth um, because the front and the back boards of, of these books um, weren't weren't the same shape. So I had to make two, and it also enabled installation into the exhibition without touching the item. They could be turned easily by keeping the two plinths and the plastazote in place and turning and just turning it over. Um, and this is Jackie Hinkson's book. This is uh, Bondina that I said I use a lot. So I've cut out a four flap uh, envelope in Bondina. And then this is just wrapped, this is wrapped around the book. That the book then is placed uh, on, onto a layer of plastazote. It is protected with the um, the plastazote L's that which keep the book in the middle of the plastazote and then there is another sheet of plastazote that goes on the top and then the the, the book folds up and we with these 
um, we always tell, we always put on the box that the box contains the textile bind, binding. And we also put in some instructions as to how to package it up and, and um, to repack it and unpack it so that the people in the, who are using the book in the, in the reading room know what to do and the staff in the reading rooms know to check it because it's a textile binding. I've done quite a lot of training with the reading room staff. Um, and that is the book all packaged up in its box. And as you can see, there's its shelf mark, handle with care and textile binding. Just a little bit about mannequins for exhibitions. As I said, the library don't have, have many uh, sort of clothes, um, clothing items. So most, in fact, all of the items that you'll see in the next few slides are loans for exhibitions. Um, this is a, a tabard. So there were two tabards that were borrowed from um, Egger Museum Trust. And these were, and it is our duty to, to make sure we support the loan items properly during the period of the exhibition. So the exhibition period is usually uh, three months. Um, so we used, um, in this case, some, uh, a mannequin or two mannequins that we that we already that we already possess. And this um, this lady, this beautiful costume, um, uh, carnival costume. We were given this mannequin by the VNA. Um, I had to. Uh, they've done something. I'm not quite sure what they've done, but I think they they had padded her uh, her a lot, and that padding was removed. So I had to create her uh, a padded bra, so that uh, we could dress her properly. And that was that was the costume that was that was in the West Africa. Uh, the carnival costume in the West Africa exhibition. I was then allowed uh, to um, get a uh, or purchase a mannequin for Vivian Lee's Lady Macbeth dress. Um, it was absolutely tiny, so I think we had to buy a child's mannequin, but she needed a 1950s profile. And I'm sorry, I can't show you that dress because the uh, um, I didn't get permission to show you the image, but it was very important to have the right profile for the, the period of dress that it, the, that it was. And that same mannequin we used in the next exhibition to support uh, this silk dress. This was a, a Second World War printed silk dress. It was printed, it was made from silk mats. Um, and uh, we, my colleague created a, um, a bodice for it, a padded bodice, to, because this dress was much bigger than the Lady Macbeth dress or the Vivian Lee dress. So she created, and, uh, and I made her a skirt and that supported the dress uh, during the period of the exhibition. Um, and this we used in our Windrush uh, exhibition. This, uh, this shirt here uh, belo belonged to the uh, author Andrea Levy's father. He wore it, uh, or he, yes, he wore it on, on the SS Windrush on his way over to the UK. And Andrea used to wear it uh, to parties um, as a a teenager and I think later on and you we could we did find when we were looking at it like lip, lipstick on the on the on the shirt and this is how it came in it was quite it was quite creased so uh, we had to get special permission for me to to work on it so I steamed it and there it is in the case on, on display with some of her manuscripts and a picture of her father right oh a picture of the SS Windrush here and I think a family photograph was in the front was in the front of the case. And this just shows you a, a very different support for uh, this T-shirt in the Women's Rights Exhibition. This wasn't uh, we didn't borrow this T-shirt. It was um, it was bought for for the exhibition, and we made a. Uh, a board cut out to the, t the shape of the t-shirt 
the board was padded with uh, polyester wadding and it was um, then covered in silk so the t-shirt could uh, slip on easily so silk is a wonderful a bit fiddly to work with but wonderful if you want to slip things on and off or, on mannequins and this was again uh, uh, for the women's rights exhibition this is a nurse's uniform and again we created I think this was the silk jersey um, which went over the, the polyester wadding to build uh, we purchased standard mannequins uh, so they weren't quite perfect for the items we were putting on them so they had to be adjusted and we had to, these underpinnings had to be made in order to support the uniform for the, for the period of display. Um, there were a number of badges on the nurses on the apron and we had to make sure that those wouldn't cause any further damage during the display and so I had to put a net support over the over the front of the of the apron. And then this was uh, surface cleaning prior to things uh, being packed and, uh, and being packed up and going and going back to the lender. So this was a, a, a student that worked with me last year and she was doing uh, surface cleaning of these items. And this is the final mannequin. We have a, a our current exhibition is called Breaking the News. And this mannequin is for a, a uniform uh, that's in that uh, in that exhibition. I'm afraid I can't show it to you uh, because it is um, I'm not I'm not allowed to under under our uh, under the terms of the exhibition. Um, but this shows you the mannequin underneath. So I, I was allowed to get a almost bespoke mannequin for this uh, for this uniform, um, but they're always made out of pieces of standard mannequins. So it was made the right width, almost the right width from here to the other thigh uh, by inserting pieces of plastisote. And again, this is a slightly different top. Uh, you can see the mechanism of bolting them together under here. So when the uniform went on, it, because it was a standard uh, contemporary mannequin, its bottom wasn't big enough. So I had to use polyester wadding to build his, his bottom up. And I, in order to keep that wadding in place, it's very easy to use tight. Um, so I just cut the feet off the tights so they were easy to get on. And then this, this, is, uh, this, is, this is the sort of pant bit of the tights. If you cut the legs off, you can, this is where the arms go. And it is very useful to keep wadding in place when you're making a, um, quite a, a, something that needs to be quite quite quick at the end before the item goes on display so and it worked it worked quite well so I'm sorry not to show you a picture of it in the exhibition but anyway I hope that is of some interest um, thank you very much for listening to me and I think hopefully that to feed some questions back to me thank you so much Liz a uh, wonderful presentation. I think we uh, could almost feel like we got a nice walkthrough of the British Library and its textiles. And also your tips were, um, I think, also very helpful, I believe, for folks being able to take care of their own textiles. So we're going to the chat. And again, I encourage everyone to um, please feel free to add your questions in. I don't quite see any questions, but Rebecca Alexander mentioned, uh, Liz, that there's actually a behind the scenes uh, video that was done by the library for installing the Vivian Lee's Lady Macbeth costume. 
So we'll definitely uh, look that up on YouTube. Uh, that should be interesting. It's always, it's always nice to sort of pull back that veil and see what goes on behind the scenes. And I know you've done that really well with your photos, but it'll be interesting to see that video and really get a sense of uh, that Lady Macbeth costume being yeah, installed. Well, that, um, I didn't know that, so I'll have a look myself, but you will see me in that. So <laughs> you will see me in that video. Excellent. I uh, welcome anyone with questions. I know, um, Liz, I wanted to just make mention, I was so intrigued to hear about the magnets that you installed, uh, that you used to install the painted gold mm -hmm. silk um, as part of your gold exhibition that's on now. Um, so I found that that was such a innovative and, and brilliant idea. And it would also help ensure that there wasn't damage happening to the, um, the silk being so delicate and fragile. So I really did like that idea. Yeah. So when, when uh, we use the magnets, we always isolate them from the item with a small piece of melanex. Um, so you don't put the magnet straight on the item, but the, the magnetic sheet that was uh, um, on the board made the, uh, the board very, very heavy. Um, but I, I oddly tested um, both a lightweight magnetic sheet and a heavier weight magnetic sheet. The mm -hmm. lightweight magnetic sheet did not pass the oddly testing. Uh, right. So even for um, temporary displays, so we have to use the um, the heavyweight sheet. Uh, so it, it ended up being a really heavy item. But I, I did stitch the textile along the top, but I didn't stitch directly into the textile. I uh, used some net to support the edges, and I stitched um, directly into the net and not into the textile. Right. And I know for, um, for things that are that old, things that are that fragile, you're really trying your best to use materials that are going to be safe. Mm -hmm. And you're going to use um, methods for um, attaching or mounting or displaying them that are going to be non-damaging. So I know that was interesting. Um, and just to mention to everyone, you might you heard Liz mention um, the Audi test. And it's a test that would be done uh, by conservators, by uh, exhibition specialists, et cetera, to test the material to see if there's going to be anything damaging um, as the material encounters different conditional environment, sorry, different environmental conditions. Um, so I know, Liz, you would have done that with those magnetic uh, sheeting and then yeah. making that decision to ensure that you had uh, materials that were going to be safe mm -hmm. for the items when they were on display for an extended period. Because that exhibition runs all the way till October, you said? Yes, yeah, 2nd of October. It, it, it closes. Right. So our exhibitions are normally for a three-month period or they're, mm -hmm. they're about. Um, somebody's just waving at me <laughs> um yes yeah, so normally for a, a three month a three month period right yeah there's one question uh that someone placed here how do you decide whether to add arms to the mannequins or not it in my experience it's better to have arms for a mannequin because because that's how if it was a dress, that's how it would have been worn, and that, and that they, they, uh, you know, they're quite supportive. So if you're, if you didn't have arms, then your sleeves, uh, your sleeves would just flop, and uh, and you would get the, the textile would sort of, sort of go together. So it just makes it look better. If I mean, if it had, if it was a sleeveless dress or something, then you could get away with not, with not. But anything with arms, that our arms are quite supportive uh, to what to what we wear. They um, and the same with legs. We the the mannequin, the very last mannequin, um, as I say, it was a bespoke mannequin. But that mannequin didn't have feet. It it, it stopped at his ankles. Well, feet are very important to hold the shape of your trousers. So if you don't have feet, that 
the, the bottom of the trousers go in and they don't look as though they're, they're in the correct position. So we created um, sort of some pantaloons to go inside uh, and used uh, boning that you might find in a bra to create uh, uh, sort of circular um, support within within the leg of the uh, of the trouser, the cotton trouser that we made to go in, inside, and that makes it look then it's held in position because your your calves. Are very important in that and your feet are very important to to make the trousers fit in the right position wow okay yeah that's that i i would never have imagined that that would have um been something that you would consider mm -hmm. for the feet that aspect of putting in a sort of a supportive boning uh to just sort of get it to look properly because that's the thing we want to we want to display the the textile in a way that replicates how it would have been used in real life so i know um like you're saying the arms the legs mm -hmm. uh those are things that would help sort of illustrate um you know the use of the textile in reality so that's really quite innovative there was uh thank you so much rebecca for posting the link in the chat uh, definitely, I know people will be interested to see that behind the scenes option that the British Library has on their YouTube channel. Yes. And uh, Rebecca also asked, would the British Library in cooperation with Nalis uh, have little courses to teach us some of the tricks of the trade? Now, I know that I included in the resources, Liz, uh, from what you sent me, uh, the collections care uh, pages, that also do have a lot of insight and information. We've used them quite often in the past as references yeah. uh, for just sort of teaching you a lot of the basic things as it relates to preservation. But um, you know, maybe maybe down the road, it's definitely something we can consider. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, it, it's it, it's difficult because of course everything is everything is different. So, but uh, you know, you can. Um, I've done. Um, you know, teaching people how to roll textiles that's a really useful uh, thing to learn to be able to do because uh, textiles if they're not rolled properly they become creased and right. that's really useful. again just how you pack package something lining your box with tissue and how you interleave tissue within within um, an item is is also a useful um a useful uh, thing to do because it, you're just isolating different different textiles from each other within a box. Right. Mm -hmm. And I know uh, definitely how we store something for the long term is going to have that big impact, particularly for the textiles. So yeah, so I, I I think that that aspect of learning a little bit more on on that would. I think be yeah. really beneficial. So, yeah, so particularly the, the textile covered books, um, because normally they are just sitting on the shelf. And when you go and retrieve a book, you pull it off the shelf. And however careful you might be, you will abrade the, the, right. the textile. And, uh, and that goes, goes for a, a 17th century book as well as a contemporary book. The, they're equally as vulnerable in in that situation. So, um. mm -hmm. yeah, uh, Liz, there's one question uh, that I think you may be able to answer, at least from the UK and UK perspective. What textile conservation programs would you recommend? Is there uh, any that there you is, can easily sort of give us in um, mind? There is only one textile conservation program. Um, it's it's it's, it's the one I, I did. It's been through different manifestations. So when I studied, I, I was part of um, in, um, University of Southampton, um, but now uh, you, it, it's part of Glasgow University. So it's an MPhil at Glasgow University. And I, uh, I, I usually get one student a year from Glasgow for six weeks, um, and they work with me for six weeks. So. Um, 
it, it, it's a very good course and it is it is the only one in the UK. Right. Okay, great. Thank you for that. And uh, another question. Uh, when the textile bound books like Jackie Hinkson's item are uh, protected in the way that you showed during your presentation, does it mean that the users will never have the visual and textile pleasures of seeing and feeling the textile? Or Oh, no, not, a, not uh, at all. Not at all. That's it. Mm -hmm. That book is available for, uh, for reference, for taking out in the uh, in one of the reading rooms, uh, so that is available. There's, uh, if Nicole's listening, and there's no reason why that book should be restricted, but mm -hmm. the the book that might be restricted would be the Holy Bible from uh, 1637. That may well be restricted, but not necessarily. I'm, I mean, the the collection is for everyone. It's it's. We're not a museum, we are a reference library, so it, it is amazing what you can take out um, and consult in the reading rooms. Obviously, you can't take it home because we're a reference library, but you can consult in right. the reading rooms. Excellent. And once it's taken out of the enclosure, you can you know, enjoy it fully Absolutely. through Absolutely. the pages, yes. handle it. Yes. Handle it with care, but of course you're able to access and enjoy all of it. Yeah. And uh, thank you so much for included, uh, including one of our Sons of the Soil um, books by um, including that Jackie Hinkson piece. Uh, that was very interesting to see the care that you gave uh, for that binding. And uh, just another question coming in. Are there, um, are there areas for short stints of training in order for us for someone to perfect some of these techniques i know you mentioned an intern coming from the um glasgow university textile program yeah but uh, are there any other opportunities for for short bits of training uh i think not not in the U uk except if you there is quite a lot of information on 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 the web on the web that, and um, you you there is there is um, there is there are some links about packing wedding dresses there are there is a lot there's quite a lot of conservation associated links on the website um, right. if you look at if you look at glasgow they uh, they will have uh, Glasgow University Textile Conservation. They they have blogs. I haven't done much recently, but there are textile blogs. Look at the V the V and A have a really interesting uh, site. Lots of information about well uh, embroideries that they have they have. But you can find um, ca uh, Canadian Conservation Institute. Right. Uh, let, let, let me ha let me have a think, and I can, Danielle, I'll give you some, maybe some links for, that you could share. Great, that I would be that's... that would be good. And just by the way, I know Camille would have taken part in that program in 2016. Is that conservation work volunteer opportunity something that's still uh, running on an annual basis um, for, yeah. let's say, other? Um, other heritage professionals probably thinking I, of, hey, you know, it would be great to expand their skills and training. I don't, I don't know, but uh, I don't know. And I know, just, I know the public would have thrown a lot of things into a tailspin uh, mm, with respect yes, to, you yes, know, yes, yes. But, we, yeah. but, uh, but we, we did manage to do a textile conservation placement um, during lockdown. <laughs> Um, nice. but the first lockdown, we, we, I did a remote uh, um, project with a student from Glasgow, and last year we managed 50% of the time in the studio um, and 50% otherwise. So, um, Great. But, uh, but usually when people come in, it, it's like Camille did, she came in from Nallis. Um, the students that come to me are are actively involved in a um, a, their, their MPhil, their MA. Um, so it's right. usually parts of something like that. It's but we do, you know, we're always you, you could a lot of the links 
on the not particularly about con conservation, but some of the links I've given you about there's a lot of information behind about the exhibitions. There is a lot of information on uh, the BL conservation website, not textile mm -hmm. information because I haven't I haven't written anything. Well, apart from I've done some blogs, but I haven't particularly I haven't written a little uh, uh, preservation book to it. Um, right. But I, I I will see what yeah. I, I will see what I can find and feed it feed it back to you. Excellent. So I and that um, listing of resources, a uh, list of materials and tools that uh, Liz provided, um, as well as all of the links that would have been referenced uh, during the presentation are all included in a document that all participants and registrants could download. Uh, so you'll receive that link and just a reminder that it will expire on the 27th of July, I believe, which is just a week's time. So it gives you enough time to access the link and download the document. Uh, but Liz, I think that is about all of the questions. Uh, if you had any uh, final words just as we wrap up. Um, I was just going to say that I don't think I mentioned that I was going, I'm going to send a reference box of samples for you that will go into your collection so you can uh, come and consult those. Um, um, I'm still working on it, so, but it will come. It will come in the post eventually, and go and right. Kind of, that that and would I, be wonderful. Yeah, and and I we will, look forward to that for sure. Yeah, and I will make it like the boxes I've packed the uh, textile books in, so you can see how that exactly how that book how those boxes work. Ah. That's a that's a really good idea. So the box itself also becomes a teaching tool yeah. as well. Yeah, I think that would be great. And we look forward to that. Definitely, <laughs> we will um, we will keep it. We will keep it as a reference item um, that would be accessible again, similarly through our reading room in the Heritage Library Division uh, for anyone sort of wanting to get that insight on uh, the textile materials uh, that are used at the British Library. And I see Nicole is volunteering, Liz, to personally take it to Nalis for us. Uh, I might Nicole, be, Rachel, that I, would be, that'll be wonderful. I might, well, I might volunteer myself. <laughs> <laughs> That would be awesome. So thank you so very much, Liz, uh, for your um, sharing your information, sharing all of your knowledge, uh, giving us the insight into the British Library and sharing with us those wonderful tips as to how we should go about caring and storing and taking um, preservation measures with our textiles. And I see that uh, Jasmine has her hand up. Um, Ms. Simmons, Director of Heritage Library. Hello. Hi, good, good morning. Hello, it's hello. Yet. <laughs> so there's, it's already in, in the yeah. yes, there's afternoon in the UK. Yes, it's afternoon. So Elizabeth, I want to thank you for such a, a very interesting session. It was really lovely, you know, I see seeing the images and I'm, I just wish I was uh, in con into conservation so that I could just go right away and just start practicing some of these <laughs> techniques. It's so interesting because of the wide variety of materials that we have here at the Heritage Library. I'm always excited when we get to expand our knowledge in this way and really create things that are different and unique and continue to share this within with our colleagues here in Trinidad and Tobago. I want to also just take the opportunity to thank Daniel and her team for organizing you know, this session. I think this is the last in the series, Daniel. For season two, yep. For season two. And I just want to congratulate Daniel on doing such a remarkable, amazing job in leading us through this series. And I think a lot of people have been able to log in across the, across the world from different continents. Our numbers may look few, but the reach is what is important and the information that has been has gone out it is so it was so important and timely and i think that we are looking forward to season three and what season three 
uh, may bring. Daniel, maybe we broadcasting to us, maybe from some other country, you know, really just and, mm -hmm. and really applying all those techniques again. So I just want to thank Daniel and the team at Preservation and Conservation Lab and by extension Heritage Library. You all have done a great job. You have done an excellent job. Keep it going and we look forward for season three. Yes, thank you so much, Mr. Simmons. And in fact, Liz, I know we, we've, you know, behind the scenes sort of discussed yeah. the possibility of more because there was so much information that could be shared about textiles. So thank you for your willingness to sort of be tagged uh, in the future. Uh, yeah. And we definitely look forward to further collaboration. And we thank you so much yeah. uh, for the yeah. sharing of information. And I just want to yeah. thank everyone who's attending. Thank you for um, participating. Thank you for uh, supporting our webinars. And for those who go on and view it on YouTube, when we have those fully transcribed videos uploaded, thank you so very much, everyone. And, and thank you for inviting me. Thank you very much indeed. It's been a great pleasure to work with you. Thank you, Liz.